up a lot in here. I just want my life to mean something. That they, from that identity or public perception, they may look more terrible or more. We're going to the dining room to eat. I listen to my radio a lot. Music seems to take. As I was on the phone, Mike came out of the room. He tried to hit me over my head. Before she was arrested for killing Reagan Hancock and cutting her baby from her womb. Prosecutors emphasized the heinousness of the crime and reminded the jury that they could send Parker to death row based on that alone. Parker's attorney says the system and Parker's family let her down. When Parker would have been in an ambulance on the way to the hospital and never mentioned what was going on. Killings all began like this. A middle-aged man pulled over to pick up Lee Wernos. A different person than she was in 1983, and it's, uh, if you sit down with Carla Faye Tucker, you, it's very difficult not to be touched by her. I can't even comprehend what Bobby's family went through. The tissue that was found on the gun was an exact match to the tissue that I had submitted to the lab. Call it death row? No, we call it life row. In a chilling tale of deception and violence, a woman's alluring facade conceals a sinister truth. As she faces her reckoning on execution day, emotions run high. Discover the shocking story. Background. In a chilling and brutal crime that sent shockwaves through the tight-knit community of New Boston, Texas, Taylor Rainey Parker, a 29-year-old woman, was found guilty of the heinous laying of 21-year-old Reagan Mitchell Simmons Hancock in October 2020. This heart-wrenching case unfolded over the course of a two-year legal battle, ultimately revealing the shocking details of the crime that would forever haunt those involved. On that fateful October day, the unsuspecting Simmons Hancock herself, 35 weeks pregnant, became the target of Parker's malevolent scheme. The scene that followed was nothing short of a nightmare. Parker, driven by a twisted motive, subjected Simmons Hancock to a barrage of over 100 knifing wounds, a level of brutality that defies comprehension. To further compound the horror, she utilized a blunt object, believed to be a hammer, to crush the young mother's skull. In a move that defies belief, Parker then took up a scalpel and surgically removed the unborn child, Braxlyn Sage, from the victim's womb. Noting that none of Taylor Parker's family were in the courtroom today, Parker was handcuffed immediately after sentencing and removed from the courtroom as soon as the victim's family finished their impact statements. The loss added a layer of heartbreak to an already devastating crime, leaving the community in mourning for the young victim and her unborn child. Prosecutors argued that this elaborate charade was driven by Parker's desperate fear of her boyfriend abandoning her upon discovering her infertility. In a rare but just outcome for a crime of such magnitude, Taylor Rennie Parker was sentenced to demise. The victim's mother, grappling with the unbearable loss of her daughter and grandchild, fittingly labeled Parker as an evil piece of flesh. The horror of this incident lingers, casting a shadow over the community and serving as a poignant reminder of the capacity for darkness within the human soul. In the wake of such unimaginable tragedy, the community finds solace in the knowledge that justice has been served, albeit through a grueling and painful legal process. The Taylor Rennie Parker Case In a case that continues to shock and appall, Taylor Rennie Parker's web of deception led to a gruesome act of violence. Desperate to maintain her relationship, Parker resorted to faking a pregnancy, weaving an intricate web of lies that ultimately culminated in a brutal slaying. As the trial unfolded, prosecutors painted a chilling picture of Parker's deception. She meticulously orchestrated a facade of pregnancy, displaying an alarming level of dedication to her ruse. Before she was arrested for killing Reagan Hancock and cutting her baby from her womb. Could be sentenced to death after being convicted last month of murdering 21 year old Reagan Hancock and her unborn baby. From fabricated ultrasounds to a carefully orchestrated gender reveal party, Parker's performance was described by prosecutors as that of a consummate actress. Her social media presence was flooded with posts about her purported pregnancy, all designed to cement the illusion. 
The level of premeditation revealed during the trial was staggering. Investigators unearthed evidence suggesting that Parker had extensively researched premature births before carrying out the heinous act. In the aftermath of this unspeakable crime, Parker was apprehended by Oklahoma police in October 2020. Facing charges of first-degree slaying and kidnapping, she entered a plea of not guilty, setting the stage for a harrowing legal battle that would expose the depths of human depravity. The Taylor Rainey Parker case stands as a stark reminder of the capacity for darkness within the human soul. It is a chilling tale of manipulation, deception, and the devastating consequences that can arise from a heartless pursuit of self-interest. As the trial unfolds, the community and the nation at large watch with bated breath, seeking justice for the innocent lives lost in this appalling act. Deception and Brutality The horrifying details of Taylor Rennie Parker's heinous act are as follows. Michelle Simmons Hancock, the victim, endured a nightmarish attack. Parker, in a gruesome and calculated attack, cut and knifed Michelle multiple times. The extent of the deceit was staggering, with layers of lies and fraudulent acts perpetuated by Parker. Crisp emphasized that comprehending this web of deception was essential to understanding the gravity of the crime. The calculated nature of the deception was such that it passed a point of no return, culminating in a horrific act of homicide. Hancock died at the scene. Her baby was pronounced dead at an Oklahoma hospital. A heavy, a heavy burden feels lifted. I feel like now we can start trying to heal. Parker's method of attack was barbaric and left no doubt about the deliberate nature of her actions. She subjected Michelle to over 100 knife wounds and inflicted further trauma by crushing her skull. With a scalpel in hand, Parker surgically removed the unborn baby from Michelle's womb, sealing the fate of both victims. Medical Testimonies and Irrefutable Evidence In the trial of Taylor Rennie Parker, a horrifying tale of deception and violence unfolded, leaving a shocked community and a grieving family in its wake. Central to the prosecution's case were the compelling medical testimonies and the wealth of evidence that laid bare the extent of Parker's depravity. As the trial progressed, prosecutors presented a barrage of medical evidence that painted a vivid picture of the events leading up to Michelle Simmons Hancock's tragic demise. Medical professionals testified with unwavering certainty, leaving no room for doubt. They affirmed that the infant, cruelly stolen from Michelle's womb, had indeed shown signs of life with a heartbeat upon birth. This testimony dispelled any notion that the child was never alive, firmly establishing the gravity of Parker's crimes. The prosecution revealed that Parker, consumed by a desperate fear of losing her boyfriend, had resorted to an elaborate plan of deception. Over the course of nearly 10 months, she fabricated a pregnancy with astonishing dedication, leaving those around her utterly convinced of the lie. The staged ultrasound, the careful curated social media post, and the staged gender reveal party were all part of Parker's elaborate ruse, showcasing her acting prowess. A neurologist testified saying Parker's brain is, quote, broken. He pointed to scans showing shrinking tissue. When Parker would have been in an ambulance on the way to the hospital and never mentioned what was going on. The online searches conducted by Parker further revealed the depths of her malevolence. She sought information on delivering babies and how to falsify a pregnancy, offering a chilling glimpse into the calculated nature of her plan. The web of deceit, woven with meticulous precision, demonstrated a level of cunning and determination that defies comprehension. The trial's climax was the presentation of graphic crime scene photos, which laid bare the horrifying brutality inflicted upon Michelle Simmons Hancock. First Assistant District Attorney Kelly Crisp left no room for doubt, asserting unequivocally that Parker deserved a place on Demise Row. The photos depicted a young woman, full of promise, lying on the blood-soaked floor of her own home, a stark reminder of the unspeakable horror she endured. 
As the trial reached its conclusion, the legacy of Michelle Simmons Hancock and her unborn child loomed large. Their tragic fate serves as a stark reminder of the potential for darkness within the human soul. The verdict, though just, leaves a somber pall over the community, serving as a testament to the length some individuals will go to satisfy their darkest desires. Reagan's mother, sister, and husband gave witness statements as Parker cried on the stand. Parker's attorney says the system and Parker's family let her down. In the annals of criminal history, the Taylor Rainey Parker case will be etched as a chilling testament to the depths of human depravity and the need for justice in the face of such malevolence. Michelle's memory will forever remain in the hearts of those who knew her, a beacon of light amidst the darkness that sought to extinguish her. Sinister Surrogacy Scheme the intricate details surrounding Taylor Rennie Parker's actions reveal a web of deceit and violence that culminated in a devastating tragedy. Initially, Parker had sought to realize her twisted desire for motherhood through surrogacy. She allegedly offered a substantial sum of $100,000 to a potential surrogate mother, demonstrating the lengths to which she was willing to go to achieve her sinister goal. This offer was made through social media, revealing the calculated nature of Parker's plan. However, as the events unfolded, it became painfully clear that Parker's intentions were far from altruistic. Upon being taken into custody, Parker confessed to authorities that she had not given birth to the infant. Instead, she had brutally attacked Michelle Simmons Hancock before making off with the child. The admission painted a chilling picture of the violence that transpired, showcasing the extent of Parker's malevolence. Parker's boyfriend, Wade Griffin, was unwittingly drawn into this horrifying ordeal. He revealed that Parker had informed him she was going to give birth prematurely and instructed him to meet her at a nearby hospital. Griffin, unaware of the grim reality that awaited him, followed her instructions only to discover the nightmarish truth. The composition of the jury, consisting of six men and six women, reflects the gravity and complexity of the case. Defense lawyer Jeff Harlson urged the jurors to maintain an open mind throughout the trial, recognizing the weight of the decisions they would be called upon to make. The trial had not yet concluded, indicating that further revelations and testimonies were yet to come. Um, and I think, I absolutely think that she got the punishment that she deserved today. Prosecutors emphasize the heinousness of the crime and remind the jury that they can send Parker to death row based on that alone. The unfolding events of this trial underscored the intricacies and gravity of the case. Parker's initial pursuit of surrogacy, just opposed with her violent actions, reveals a disturbing duality. The admission of guilt further solidifies the case against her, leaving no room for doubt regarding the extent of her culpability. The jurors, tasked with determining Parker's fate, carry the immense responsibility of ensuring that justice is served for Michelle Simmons Hancock and her unborn child. As the trial progresses, the full scope of Parker's actions will continue to emerge, shedding light on the true depths of her malevolence. Trial In a trial that has gripped the nation with its brutality, Taylor Rennie Parker, 29 years old, has been sentenced to demise for capital slaying. Her victim, 21-year-old Michelle Simmons Hancock, was 35 weeks pregnant when she fell prey to Parker's calculated scheme. The details of the crime are beyond comprehension, painting a chilling portrait of evil. Tragically, Michelle's family now grapples with the unbearable loss of a daughter and sister. Emily Simmons, Michelle's sister, delivered an emotional victim impact statement, revealing the depths of their pain. The normal milestones of life will forever remain unattainable. No more birthday celebrations, no sisterly bond on her wedding day, only visits to a solemn graveyard to pay respects. The crime scene photos presented during the trial were nothing short of horrifying. They depicted Michelle, a young woman full of promise, lying on the blood-soaked floor of her own home. First Assistant District Attorney Kelly Crisp left no room for doubt, 
stating unequivocally that Parker deserves a place on Demise Row. The brutality inflicted upon Michelle was beyond imagination. She was slashed, beaten, and ultimately had her womb ripped from her in the most gruesome manner. The circumstances surrounding Michelle's demise were not just horrific, they were torture. A mother fought fiercely for her child in her final moments, leaving behind a legacy of unimaginable strength and a testament to the boundless love a mother holds for her unborn child. Jessica Brooks, Michelle's grieving mother, spared no words in her condemnation of Parker, branding her an evil piece of flesh. The anguish of losing a child in such a manner is a pain that no parent should bear. Michelle's daughter, who was also stolen from her in this act of unspeakable cruelty, never had the chance to experience the love and care of her mother. As the trial unfolded, it became clear that this was not just a slaying, but a devastating act of violence that has left a scar on the hearts of all who bear witness to it. The sentence of demise for Taylor Rennie Parker is a solemn acknowledgement of the death of her depravity and the severity of her crime. This trial serves as a chilling reminder of the potential for darkness within the human soul. The jury also heard from a former friend and co-worker who also tried to tell him things weren't adding up, feeling ill. She is the mother of the man prosecutors say Taylor Parker was trying to keep. Convicted killer Taylor Parker describes a heart-pounding encounter as testimony continues in the penalty phase of the trial. And he called for justice to be served in the face of such malevolence. The memory of Michelle Simmons Hancock and her unborn child, both robbed of their futures, will forever remain in the hearts of those who knew them and in the annals of this haunting case. Womb Raider's Sentence to Demise Parker's actions leading up to the slaying reveal a chilling level of premeditation. Fearing the loss of her boyfriend, she resorted to an elaborate and deceitful plan. She searched online for information on delivering babies and how to falsify a pregnancy, a sinister reflection of the depths of her malevolence. This pattern of deception reached its horrifying climax on the day of the slaying. On that fateful day, Parker informed her boyfriend that she would be induced to deliver the baby. The events that unfolded were beyond comprehension. After committing this brutal act, she attempted to further cover her tracks by placing the child's umbilical cord in her own. This twisted attempt at deception only adds another layer of depravity to an already horrific crime. When questioned about her motives, Parker's explanation offered little insight into the mind of a person capable of such brutality. She claimed, I wasn't in my right mind. I was freaking out. This feeble attempt to justify her actions only underscores the incomprehensibility of her crime. Throughout the trial, Parker's defense sought to challenge the severity of the charges. They argued that the baby was never alive, attempting to dismiss the kidnapping charge and reduce the capital slaying charge to a lesser offense. However, medical professionals testified that the infant did indeed have a heartbeat upon birth, dispelling any doubt about the child's status. Prosecutors meticulously laid out the evidence against Parker, revealing a sequence of calculated actions leading up to the day of the slaying. They highlighted the extensive planning and deceit, including the online searches and the pregnancy she faked for nearly 10 months. This methodical presentation of facts left little room for doubt regarding Parker's guilt. The court ultimately sentenced Taylor Rainey Parker to demise, a just but somber conclusion to a trial marked by unspeakable horror. She will now be transferred to Demise Row at the Mountain View Unit in Gatesville, Texas. While the verdict brings a measure of closure to a grieving family and a shocked community, Parker retains the right to appeal her sentence. The legacy of Michelle Simmons Hancock and her unborn child will forever remain in the hearts of those who knew them. Their tragic fate serves as a stark reminder of the capacity for darkness within the human soul and the need for justice in the face of such malevolence.
Both sides rested their cases yesterday after Parker's ex-boyfriend testified. Parker acted surprised when her mother told her that her ex-boyfriend Wade Griffin was on the stand today and she said she had doubts about Taylor being pregnant when she confronted Taylor about it. The Taylor Rennie Parker case will be etched in the annals of criminal history as a chilling testament to the lengths some individuals will go to satisfy their darkest desires. Impact on Michelle's Family The heinous and incomprehensible crime committed by Taylor Rennie Parker not only shattered the life of Michelle Simmons Hancock, but it also left an indelible mark on her grieving family. The depth of their sorrow and the enduring pain they face is immeasurable as they grapple with the profound loss of a beloved daughter, sister, and mother-to-be. Emily Simmons, Michelle's sister, bravely confronted the court, offering an emotional victim impact statement that provided a heart-wrenching glimpse into the devastating aftermath of Parker's actions. Emily's words resonate with a raw and unvarnished truth, underscoring the irreplaceable void left by Michelle's absence. Her statement embodies the collective grief felt by a family, robbed of the joyous moments they had hoped to share with Michelle throughout her life. Emily's poignant reflection on the milestones that will forever remain unrealized is a poignant reminder of the enduring pain inflicted upon Michelle's family. The absence of a cherished sister on her wedding day, the inability to witness her becoming a loving aunt, and the heartbreaking absence of a precious daughter's laughter serve as a stark reminders of the irrevocable loss they now bear. In the wake of Michelle's brutal slaying, her family is left to navigate a complex landscape of emotions, grappling with grief, anger, and an overwhelming sense of injustice. The trial proceeding serves as a harrowing reminder of the horrors inflicted upon Michelle. First Assistant District Attorney Kelly Crispus' impassioned plea for justice reverberated throughout the courtroom, leaving Michelle's family with a profound sense of vindication. The family's grief is intertwined with a profound sense of outrage towards Parker, who callously robbed them of the opportunity to see Michelle thrive as a mother. Parker's actions represent an unfathomable betrayal of the sanctity of life and an egregious violation of the bond between a mother and her child. The knowledge that Parker's depravity extended to not only taking Michelle's life, but also stealing the life of her unborn baby, compounds the family's pain. In their darkest hours, Michelle's family has rallied together finding solace in their shared memories of a young mother whose light was extinguished far too soon. They draw strength from the love they hold for Michelle, seeking to honor her memory by advocating for justice and holding Parker accountable for her heinous actions. While the trial may have provided a measure of closure, it cannot erase the profound impact this tragedy has had on Michelle's family. Their lives have been forever altered, and they can now carry the weight of their loss with them every day. For the killing of Reagan Hancock and kidnapping her unborn baby, Braxton Sage. He detailed how she convinced him she was pregnant for more than 10 months. Good evening, Dan. Connie Griffin was back on the stand today after she was interrupted yesterday due to a juror. Through their pain, they stand united in their quest for justice, determined to ensure that Michelle's memory is not defined solely by the horrific circumstances of her demise, but by the love and light she brought to their lives. Lessons Learned The chilling case of Taylor Rainey Parker offers a sobering lesson about the depths of human depravity and the importance of vigilance in identifying and preventing such heinous acts. First and foremost, the Parker case highlights the potential for deception and violence lurking beneath seemingly ordinary facades. Parker's elaborate ruse of faking a pregnancy showcase the lengths to which individuals may go to achieve their sinister goals. This serves as a stark reminder that appearances can be deceiving, and it is crucial to remain vigilant and discerning, even in seemingly benign situations. Furthermore, the tragedy underscores the paramount importance of community awareness and intervention. 
In this case, several witnesses reported Parker's offer of $100,000 for a surrogate mother, providing a crucial red flag that could have potentially averted the horrifying outcome. Encouraging open communication and empowering individuals to speak up when they observe suspicious or concerning behavior can be instrumental in preventing such tragedies. Additionally, the Parker case highlights the critical role of law enforcement and the justice system in swiftly and effectively responding to crimes of this magnitude. It is imperative that society collectively works to strengthen support networks, ensuring that pregnant individuals have access to resources and protections that safeguard their well-being. Ultimately, the Taylor Rainey Parker case serves as a haunting reminder of the darkness that can reside within the human soul. It calls for continued vigilance, community engagement, and a commitment to justice in order to prevent such tragedies from occurring in the future. About the possibility that his girlfriend might not be pregnant, but he didn't want to listen. The calls also show Parker has not owned up to any of the lies and schemes she pulled off leading up to the crime. Our reporter in the courtroom sat down with digital anchor Brittany DeFran this afternoon to talk about the testimony this week. Through learning from this harrowing experience, society can take steps toward creating a safer and more vigilant environment for all individuals, especially those who may be particularly vulnerable to such acts of violence and deceit. Eileen Wernos Eileen Wernos was born in Rochester, Michigan to a troubled family. Her father, Leo Dale Pittman, was a convicted child molester who ended herself in prison. Her mother, Diane Wernos, was an alcoholic who abandoned her children when Eileen was a child. Her grandparents raised Eileen, but she was often harmed and neglected. As a teenager, Wernos ran away from home and became involved in body work. And, and, and that's a hell of a lot of men I went through before the next jerk came along and I used protection. Killings all began like this. A middle-aged man pulled over to pick up Lee Wernos. You killed well, seven men, seven strangers. Does that not make you a serial killer? So I didn't kill him every day, did I? The way Lee tells it, she was just a hooker trying to turn a trick. And the men knew it. She also struggled with mental illness, including borderline personality disorder and dissociative identity disorder. In 1989, Wuornos began slaying her male clients. Between December 1989 and September 1990, the bodies of seven men were found along the highways of northern and central Florida. Items belonging to two victims were pawned near Daytona Beach and the alias names used were traced to Wernos through thumbprints left on the pawn shop cards. Wernos confessed to slaying all six men. She claimed she acted in self-defense as the men had physically attacked or attempted to attack and exploit her. In one of the cases, evidence was found that the culprit may have tried to attack her. However, the evidence in other cases against her was strong and she was convicted of six layings. Within two weeks of her arrest, Wernos and her attorney had sold movie rights to her story. The case resulted in several books, movies, and even one opera. The court sentenced Wernos to the ending row in each case, where she met her demise in 2002. Did I go out there every day and say, hmm, I'm gonna kill? If I did, there would well, be Well, no, it took you 12 months. Yeah last day of her miserable life on the road here, ordering her first beer at 11 in the morning. Self-defense? Yeah. Lee, the first one, perhaps, the second maybe, but so seven what? times? Number 13. Carla Faye Tucker Carla Tucker was born in Houston, Texas in 1959. She had a troubled childhood, marked by harm and neglect. She dropped out of school in the 10th grade and began using drugs and alcohol. She also became involved in body work. In 1983, Tucker and a male accomplice, Daniel Ryan Garrett, broke into an apartment in Houston. And the tension and the pressure build and it will continue to build as we get closer. And it's, uh, it's kind of terrifying in many respects. A different person than she was in 1983. And it's, uh, if you sit down with Carla Faye Tucker, you, it's very difficult not to be touched by her. That we had to say goodbye. 
and that got a little hard. Um, she said one of the most beautiful prayers that I've ever heard. With a pickaxe, they attacked the two occupants, Jerry Lynn Dean and Deborah Ann Thornton. Dean and Thornton tried to fight back but were both slain. Tucker was arrested and charged with the slaying. During the trial, she accepted a bargain, pleaded guilty to slaying Dean, and testified against her accomplice. Though the capital penalty was hardly ever sought for female slayers, Tucker and Garrett were sentenced to the ending row in late 1984. Number 12. Barbara Elaine Wood Graham Graham was born Barbara Elaine Ford in Oakland, California to Hortons Ford, who earned her living through body work. When Barbara was two, her mother was still in her late teens and was sent to reform school. Barbara was raised by strangers and extended family. As a teenager, she was arrested for vagrancy and sentenced to serve time at the same reform school where her mother had been. Released in 1939, Barbara tried to make a new start for herself. She married thrice, but all her attempts at domesticity failed. Barbara then took up body work. She soon became involved in gambling and illegal drug circles, cultivating several friends who were ex-convicts and known career criminals. In March 1953, Barbara joined her associates in robbing Mabel Monahan. Barbara reportedly gained entry by asking to use her phone. The gang demanded money and jewels from Monahan, but the 64-year-old widow refused to give them anything. At this point, according to the statement and testimony of John True, Barbara began viciously pistol-whipping Mrs. Monahan, cracking her skull, and then suffocating her with a pillow. One of her associates was later arrested on a separate charge and confessed to robbing Mrs. Monahan. An undercover officer attempted to cozy up with her, got her to admit what she had done, and then arrested her. Graham was convicted and sentenced to the end row. Number 11. Emilia Carr Emilia Lily Carr was born to a troubled family. At age 15, she disclosed harm by her father to her school but later withdrew her statement. Her father was also later arrested and imprisoned for attempting to hire someone to slay his family. In November 2008, Carr got engaged to Joshua Damien Fulgham, who married someone else, Heather Strong, a month later. However, Carr maintained contact with them and babysat Strong's children, according to Carr's family. Carr and Fulgham continued their relationship while Strong began seeing someone else. In February 2009, Heather Strong disappeared while working at an iron skillet restaurant at a petrol gas station near Interstate Route 75 in Reddick, Florida. Her remains were discovered on March 19, buried in a shallow grave near McIntosh, Florida, next to a storage trailer. Call it death row? No, we call it life row. It's life row. Mm -hmm. Life row? Mm -hmm. Why? Because we're not dying, we're living. It's hard to answer because it's like I wasn't where all that happened. A desire to make women look so bad in the media, you know? Carr was arrested on March 24 after authorities noticed her frequent statements without an attorney present. Undercover audio recordings of Carr discussing details of the crime with Fulgham's sister further incriminated her. The evidence showed that Carr tricked Strong into the storage trailer at her mother's home, placed a plastic bag over her head, and attempted to break her neck. Strong eventually died from asphyxiation while bound to a chair with a duct tape. The motive was jealousy, as Carr viewed Strong as a rival in her affections for Fulgham. During the trial, the prosecutor filed notice of intent to pursue the capital penalty due to the heinous nature of the crime. The jury found Carr guilty after only two and a half hours of deliberation. Number 10. Wanda Jean Allen Wanda Jean Allen was the first woman of color to be sentenced to the end row in the United States. Wanda Jean Allen and Gloria Leathers were a lesbian couple who shared a house in the village at 2245 Hasley. 
Any officer on patrol had been dispatched to that address for a domestic dispute at least once or twice. The two had met in prison in 1982. Some time later, after both were released from the jail, the two moved into Allen's house. On December 1, 1988, the stormy relationship came to a violent and deadly conclusion. Allen and Leathers had engaged in an altercation in the morning where cops had been dispatched. Later that day, Leathers told Allen that their relationship was over and she was moving out. While hastily helping to pack her daughter's belongings, Gloria's mother heard Allen threaten to slay Gloria. Just after 3 o'clock that afternoon, as Leathers walked up the drive of the police department to file a complaint against Allen, officers inside the department heard what sounded like a gunshot. They ran outside to see Allen holding a weapon and fleeing the scene. Paramedics rushed to the scene and attempted to help Leathers, but she later passed away. Allen was arrested a few days later in Duncan, Oklahoma after one of her relatives called the Crime Stoppers hotline to report her whereabouts and collect the reward for her capture. Allen was tried, convicted, and sentenced to the ending row. Number 9. Krista Pike Krista Gail Pike was born in West Virginia on March 10, 1976. Her mother would drink while pregnant with Krista, and doctors later said this likely contributed to an underdeveloped brain. Her parents didn't want to be involved in her life, and she was given to her grandmother. But when her grandmother passed away, Krista went to live with her mother, who didn't care for her. Pike lived a troubled life growing up. After dropping out of high school, Krista joined the Job Corps, where she met her then-boyfriend, Tetheril Ship. Krista grew jealous of a 19-year-old university goer, Colleen Slemmer, whom Krista believed to be involved with Tedrill, which fueled her anger and led to a violent confrontation. On January 12, 1995, Pike and her accomplices lured Colleen to an isolated area on campus. They attacked her, beat her with a rock, and used a box cutter to carve a pentagram into her chest. Pike smashed Colleen's skull and kept a piece of it, later showing it around campus. The authorities quickly apprehended Pike and her accomplices. In March 1996, Krista Pike stood trial for the slaying of Colleen Slemmer. She was convicted and sentenced to capital punishment, becoming the youngest woman in the United States to receive the capital penalty. Number 8. Taylor Rennie Parker a Texas woman convicted of slaying a pregnant woman and ripping out her unborn baby has been sentenced to the capital punishment, a fitting punishment for the heinous crime. A jury of six men and six women in Bowie County deliberated for less than two hours before handing down the fatal sentence for 29-year-old Taylor Rennie Parker. Parker was convicted of capital slaying for the ghastly slaughter of Reagan Michelle Simmons Hancock, 21 years old, and her infant daughter in New Boston in October 2020. Simmons Hancock's mother, Jessica Brooks, called Parker an evil piece of flesh demon. In the 10 months leading up to the slaying, Parker had faked her own pregnancy in an elaborate scheme to prevent her boyfriend from leaving her, prosecutor said. She wore pregnancy disguises, fake ultrasounds, posted about pregnancy online and even threw a gender reveal party for the fake baby. Parker, who could not conceive after a hysterectomy, told her boyfriend she would be induced to deliver the baby on the day of the slaying. Prosecutors said she intensively researched how to fake a pregnancy and watched numerous videos on delivering babies preterm at 35 weeks, which is how far along Simmons Hancock was when she was slain. On the morning of October 9, 2020, Parker crushed Simmons Hancock's skull with a hammer and knifed her more than 100 times in her home before removing her baby from her womb with a scalpel. Parker fled with the infant, a girl who later perished. After her sentencing, Parker was to be moved to the Mountain View Unit in Gatesville, Texas, where the state houses its female row inmates. Number 7. Darley Lynn Peck Routier Darlie Routier, a full-time mother from Rolla, Texas, lived with her young two sons, 
Devon and Damon. On June 6, 1996, she contacted emergency services, claiming that an invader had infiltrated her home and knifed her along with her two children. Her elder son, Devon, age 6, managed to live, but the younger Damon, age 2, succumbed to his injuries. Darley was transported to the hospital with serious injuries to her arm and throat, allegedly from warding off the attacker. However, law enforcement found no signs of forced entry or any evidence supporting her claim of an intruder, including fingerprints or footprints. The sole weapon discovered on the premises was a knife from Darley's own kitchen. Subsequently, Darley was apprehended on two charges of capital slaying. A grand jury indictment followed and the prosecution proceeded on the charge concerning the slaying of Damon, her younger child, which made a capital punishment sentence feasible given his tender age. Darley's trial began in 1997. The prosecution decided that Darley had slain her sons in a rage after an extramarital affair came to light. They highlighted her lack of defensive wounds and inconsistencies in her story including changing clothes post the incident. Conversely, the defense insisted on Darley being a victim of home invasion, arguing she had repelled the attacker in self-defense. They also claimed the prosecution's case was speculative, devoid of any tangible evidence connecting Darley to the slayings. The jury pronounced Darley guilty of capital slaying, sentencing her fatally. She remains on the row. Number 6. Lisa Marie Montgomery Lisa Marie Montgomery was held guilty for the horrifying slaying of Bobby Joe Stennett in 2004. In a gruesome incident, Montgomery butchered the pregnant Stennett, extracted her unborn baby from her womb, and abducted the baby. The crime was instigated through an online interaction on a Rat Terrier chat room, Ratter Chatter, where Montgomery posing as Darlene Fisher claimed to be pregnant as well and bonded with Stennett over their supposed pregnancies. She then scheduled a meeting at Stennett's residence under the ruse of purchasing a rat terrier. Lisa told me that she cut the cord, held it between her fingers, put the baby inside her coat. She doesn't get that opportunity to hold her baby because that woman took that right away from her. This, is, this was not a spontaneous fit of anger or rage. This was meticulously planned out. I can't even comprehend what Bobby's family went through. On December 16, 2004, Montgomery went forth with a brutal crime. She strangled Stennett with a pink neon rope at her home in Skidmore, Missouri, and surgically removed the premature baby from her womb. Following the act, she attempted to portray the newborn girl as her biological child. Stinnett's mother, Becky Harper, found her daughter in a pool of blood an hour post the attack. She reported the incident to 911, recounting her daughter's injuries as if her stomach had exploded. Stinnett could not be revived by the paramedics and was declared disease at St. Francis Hospital in Maryville, Missouri. The subsequent day, Montgomery was apprehended at her farmhouse and the infant was recovered. The baby girl, named Victoria Jo Stinnett, was returned to her father, Zeb Stinnett. In her trial, Montgomery was prosecuted under the Federal Kidnapping Act for kidnapping resulting in a demise. She was argued to have pseudosciasis, a mental disorder that leads a woman to falsely assume she is pregnant and display signs of pregnancy. Renowned neuroscientist V. S. Ramachandran suggested her crime resulted from severe pseudosciences delusion triggered by her traumatic past involving physical exploitation and PTSD. Contrarily, forensic psychiatrist Park Dietz dismissed the theory, deeming Montgomery free of pseudosciences. After a trial on October 22, 2007, Montgomery was found guilty of slaying. Four days later, the jury proposed a capital sentence. Montgomery was finally put down by lethal injection on January 13, 2021. Number 5. Lisa Cunningham 
mom of six, Lisa Cunningham could become the first Australian woman on the row in the United States if she's found guilty over her stepdaughter Stana's demise. Cunningham, 48, has been behind bars in Arizona since she and her husband Jermaine was arrested over the six-year-old's demise in 2017. They are both charged with one count of first-degree slaying and several counts of child harm. They've pleaded not guilty. If the couple is convicted, prosecutors have indicated that they will apply the capital penalty, something Australia strongly opposes. The 48-year-old, who was born and raised in Adelaide, has been waiting for her day in court since her arrest. Sana Cunningham, Germain's biological daughter, perished in February 2017. In the months leading to her demise, after she'd turned six, the family noticed concerning changes in her behavior. She started forgetting basic tasks like opening a door or a water bottle. The family couldn't understand what was happening to their little girl. In July 2016, Sana was diagnosed with acute schizophrenia. Her parents said she had been tearing at her skin and hearing voices urging her to slay. She would urinate and defecate on the floor inside the house and gauge at her eyes. Child safety authorities visited the Cunningham household twice. Cunningham said they watched Sana decline and knew of her condition. The Australian Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade is providing consular assistance to the 48-year-old and we have yet to see how her case will turn out. Number 4. Pamela Perillo in February 1980, Linda Fletcher and Mike Biddle, a newlywed couple from California, met Pamela Perillo and soon after they became involved in a robbery. To avoid arrest, the couple fled to Arizona and was later joined by Perillo, who had also had an arrest warrant. They hitchhiked to Texas, where they met Bob Banks, a man relocating his belongings. Banks offered them a ride and a job to help him move unknowingly setting the scene for a horrific crime. Banks, unaware of the danger, treated his guests to meals and shelter. After observing his wealth and firearm collection, Briddle and Perillo hatch a plot to rob him. On the evening of February 21, 1980, the trio went to a rodeo in a restaurant with Banks, who later returned home with them. At the house, they found Bob Skeens, a friend of Banks who had come to help him move. The following day, Briddle and Perillo planned an ambush, arming themselves with Banks' weapons. When Banks and Skeens returned from a coffee run, they were caught off guard and subdued. Briddle and Perillo tied them up, robbed Banks, and ransacked his bedroom. In an unimaginable act of cruelty, they strangled Banks and Skeens while recording the slaughters then casually ate the breakfast the victims had brought. After committing the slaying, Briddle, Perillo, and Fletcher fled to Denver, abandoning Skeen's Volkswagen with incriminating evidence inside. When Banks failed to show up at work for two days, his supervisor discovered the crime scene. The police investigation and subsequent trials led to Briddle's fatal punishment in 1995, Fletcher's probation, and Perillo's sentencing to life imprisonment plus 30 years for aggravated robbery after her capital sentence was overruled on appeal. Number 3. Melissa Elizabeth Lucio Melissa Elizabeth Lucio, born June 18, 1969, was the first Hispanic woman sentenced to the capital penalty in Texas. She was convicted of the slaying of her two-year-old daughter, Mariah. The prosecution claimed the child's bruising and internal injuries resulted from harm and neglect, while the defense attributed them to a fall down the stairs. Lucio's case came under the spotlight in the 2020 documentary, The State of Texas vs. Melissa. Throughout, she maintained her innocence. Her punishment, set for April 27, 2022, was stayed by an appeals court two days prior. Number 2. Christina Marie Riggs Christina Marie Riggs, a licensed nurse, was convicted of slaughter by smothering her two preschool-aged children in their beds at the family Sherwood home. On November 4, 1997, 
Riggs obtained the antidepressant Elevil from her pharmacist, the painkiller morphine and the toxic potassium chloride from the hospital where she worked. The heart-stopping potassium chloride is the same drug used in the lethal cocktail injected into condemned inmates in the end house. Riggs gave the children a small amount of Elevil to put them to sleep. Then she placed each of the children in their beds. About 10 p.m., she injected 5-year-old Justin with undiluted potassium chloride. But unless it is diluted, the drug causes burning and pain. Justin woke and cried out in terror. She then smothered the boy with a pillow. Number 1. Marilyn K. Plants Marilyn K. Plants was put down via lethal injection on May 1, 2001 at Oklahoma State Penitentiary for the slaying of her husband, James Earl Plants, in 1988. William Bryson, also sentenced to the capital punishment, was put down in 2000 for his role in the slaying. A third accomplice, Clinton Eugene McKimball, received life imprisonment after pleading guilty and testifying against Plants and Bryson. The case was built around the allegations that Plants had arranged her husband's slaying to claim two life insurance policies worth $319,000. James Plants was brutally beaten with baseball bats and subsequently burned in his pickup truck. Marilyn Plants, Bryson, and McKimball were charged with first-degree slaying, with prosecutors pushing for the capital penalty. Gasoline uh, or something in that order was used that it burned so hot that the glass actually melted. There were only two people in the house, according to Joyce Cohen, when this homicide occurred. Tissue that was found on the gun was an exact match to the tissue that I had submitted to the lab. And one of them ends up dead, you should suspect the other person until your suspicions are relieved. Plant's punishment made her the second woman to be put down in Oklahoma since 1907. Molested at age 10, Pamela Perillo ended childhood and reeled through foster homes, juvenile detention, and beginner drug use. By age 24, hopelessly into drugs, she was convicted of capital slaying in Houston, Texas, and sentenced to demise by lethal injection. Linda Fletcher wed Mike Brittle in California in February of 1980. During this time, they were introduced to Pamela Perillo through a common acquaintance. Shortly after, Perillo, Brittle, and an additional unnamed guy robbed a man who was a client at the California topless bar where Perillo worked at. On February 14, 1980, Brittle and his then-wife Linda Fletcher left California to avoid being arrested for robbery. Perillo joined the pair in Tucson, Arizona after learning there was a warrant out for her arrest a few days later. The group eventually arrived in Houston, Texas after securing transportation from a number of truck drivers. Brittle, Perillo, and Fletcher were hitchhiking in the vicinity of the Houston Astrodome in the evening of Friday, February 21, 1980. They were offered a ride by Bob Banks, who was in the midst of moving, and he offered to pay them if they could assist him. Perillo, Fletcher, and Brittle all concurred. After helping him move some of his possessions into the home he had just rented, he treated them to dinner at a nearby restaurant. Fletcher and Perillo noticed that Banks had several hundred dollars in his wallet, and Perillo informed Brittle about the cash. The following day, they assisted Banks in moving some of his items. That evening, Brittle, Perillo, and Fletcher stayed the night at Banks' new home as his guests. While doing so, Brittle noted that Banks had a few firearms. While Banks was taking a shower, Brittle called a friend in California and urged him to visit Texas because he had a pigeon out here with lots of money and guns. When Brittle suggested committing a robbery, the Californian companion declined. The same evening, Banks invited his guests to accompany him to a rodeo at the Astrodome. Perillo informed Brittle in the Astrodome that she wanted to slay Banks and he said okay. Perillo became angry when he advised her to relax and went off to do some planning. Following the rodeo, Banks once more invited his friends to a nearby restaurant for dinner before going back to his house. They discovered Bomb Schemes, a friend of Banks who had arrived in his Volkswagen to assist his friend relocate when they drew up in front of the property. The following morning, Banks and Skeens went to get everyone coffee and pastries. Brittle equipped himself with a shotgun 
and Perillo armed herself with a revolver while Banks and Skeens were away. Those guns belonged to Banks. While anxiously awaiting the two men's arrival, Brittle hopped up and down. Perillo hid in the bedroom after Banks and Skeens left and Brittle entered a closet. He started tapping his foot. Brittle stepped out of the closet as Banks attempted to unlock it, shouting, This is a robbery. Skeens knelt on the ground and begged for forgiveness, which is out of character for Skeens. Skeens was the kind of man who, given the right circumstances, might lose his cool quickly and cause serious harm to others. I bring anything out about her background. She had been abused as a child. This turning state evidence on me and claiming not to even be in the house. What happened to those two bobs was trapped. I had to realize it wasn't God that took Carla. The thing that goes away or that I ever stop thinking about. I'll never be able to give back what I took. There was no line between uh, a, a juvenile and adult for the death penalty. Me and Mike were kind of co -e Brittle smacked Banks on the side of the head with the shotgun, sending him to the ground and causing him to bleed. Banks approached Brittle, thinking it was a joke. Then, Carrillo emerged from her hiding location and instructed Banks to sit on the ground because it wasn't a joke. Banks and Skeens were bound with rope by Perillo and Brittle after they had obtained a machete and cut some rope. Brittle and Perillo grabbed the men's wallets after they were shackled. Banks's wallet contained $800, which Brittle removed and displayed while claiming to have it. Brittle stole clothing and a backpack after searching the bedroom. A camera and a tape player were discovered by Perillo. This tape recorder, which was used to capture the slings, was later sold at a Denver pawn shop. The Denver police received the tape that had been left in the recorder after the pawnbroker listened to the recording on it, which helped them secure a conviction. Brittle escorted Skeens into the bedroom and informed him that he had already slaved five people and that the other two weren't important. A little while later, Fletcher saw Banks' neck being double-wrapped with a piece of rope. Fletcher asserts that Brittle told her to wait in Skeens' Volkswagen at this point, but Perillo would subsequently assert that Fletcher was equally at fault in his remarks. Brittle allegedly said, Y'all are going to be a part of this, according to Perillo's sworn testimony. At this point, it should be mentioned that Fletcher had blood on her jeans when she was taken into custody in Denver. Additionally, Fletcher would tell authorities that the last time she saw Banks was when he dropped off on the motorway while also claiming to have seen Brittle tie the rope around Banks' neck. According to court documents, Perillo and Brittle strangled Banks while recording it on the cassette recorder. Bob Skeens, who was in the adjacent room, heard what was happening and realized he would soon be the target. After that, they took a break and enjoyed the coffee and donuts that Banks and Skeens had kindly purchased for their visitors. When they had finished their break, they similarly strangled Skeens. I don't enjoy looking at you, your face is getting blue, Perillo arrived at the Volkswagen with the shotgun covered in a blanket around 20 minutes later. The revolver, machete and the other stuff were also brought out by her. Riddle produced a rifle and a backpack. After that, they transported Skeens' Volkswagen to Dallas where they left it in a garage and from there they caught a bus to Denver. The machete and a contact lens case with Brittle's fingerprints on them were still inside the Volkswagen when the Dallas police found it. His supervisor visited Banks' home to look into his absence from work for two days. Looking through a window, the man with the supervisor noticed a body. When the police got on the scene, they discovered Banks and Skeens' bodies, both of which had ropes around their necks. The chief medical examiner, Dr. Joseph Jakomczyk, found that each had passed away from suffocation brought on by rope strangling. In 1995, Brittle was put to demise. Five years of probation were imposed on Fletcher. Due to a jury mistake during her first trial, Perillo was tried again for slay. Both juries found her guilty and condemned her to demise. Perillo filed a federal habeas corpus petition in 1998 claiming that her second slate trial wasn't properly represented and that her lawyer had been disbarred for lying to a client. The Fifth Circuit Court of Criminal Appeals thus decided that Perillo must either be tried again or discharged. In order to avoid having to retry an 18-year-old case, the state reached an agreement with Perillo who agreed to a life sentence plus 30 years in prison for aggravated robbery. Appellant's conviction and sentencing affirmed. 
the appellant's first conviction for capital slate was reversed by the court for error committed during voir dire. The appellant has now been tried and convicted a second time, and the jury answered special issues affirmatively. The trial court assessed her punishment at demise. The appellant raises five points of error which will be recited in the facts. The evidence presented at the appellant's trial parallels that adduced at a separate trial of her co-defendant Mike Brittle. The appellant fled California with his wife Linda Fletcher and hitchhiked to Texas where they met Robert Banks and Bob Skeens. They robbed Banks of his hand and ankles, bound them with nylon rope, and slayed them in the same grisly manner. The appellant maintains that she was denied effective assistance of counsel in her first point of error. She contends that the trial court erred in failing to inquire into the existence of a conflict of interest on the part of lead defense counsel when the court knew or should have known that a particular conflict existed. She also contends that her attorney, James Skelton, was hampered in his ability to cross-examine Linda Fletcher, an accomplice witness at appellant's trial because he had earlier represented Fletcher in her own aggravated robbery trial stemming from the same transaction. The appellant's attorney, Will Gray, informed the trial court that she had instructed her to assert her attorney-client privilege as to any privileged communications between her and Mr. Skelton based on his prior representation. The appellant's first point of error is that the trial court didn't inquire into the existence of a conflict of interest on the part of lead defense counsel when the court knew or should have known that a particular conflict existed. The trial court failed to make a detailed inquiry at the first moment it should have appeared that a potential for conflict of interest existed. However, as matters developed, it became clear that there was no actual conflict. Skelton was instrumental in obtaining Fletcher's presence for the state at Brittle's trial, but didn't hear the testimony she gave there. All got together and they were basically hitchhiking across the country. We were all pretty much heroin addicts. Speed. I was working as a topless dancer. My confession is what got me the death penalty. They used to whip us with um, curtain rods and extension cords. Skelton never discussed the details of the morning of the slings until the night before she took the stand at appellant's trial. The appellant likens her situation to that in the United States versus Martinez, where the government called a witness at Martinez's trial who hadn't been on its witness list and whom his trial counsel had represented in a prosecution arising from the same transaction. The court required counsel to proceed and he conducted an apparently vigorous cross-examination even seeming to violate that confidence to some extent. However, the Fifth Circuit found an actual conflict to exist. Skelton affirmatively demonstrated that no breach of confidential communication between attorney and client could have trenched upon his ability to cross-examine Fletcher for the simple reason that no such communication pertaining to the actual events transpiring on the morning of February 23, 1980 took place between them during the period of his representation of her. Thus, we perceived no conflict. However, the appellant maintained Skelton was ineffective in as much as his prior representation of Fletcher and subsequent social and personal involvement with her prevented her from having an objective view of this evidence. Under the circumstances presented, we cannot conceive any more reasonable tactic than that which counsel pursued. The appellant, Fletcher and Brittle were involved in a robbery and slate case in Texas. The appellant demanded half of the money from the women's unit in Huntsville, and the appellant instructed Fletcher to keep her mouth shut if they were ever discovered. They dined on steak in Dallas, and Fletcher overheard Brittle replaying a tape recording she had made on Banks' cassette recorder. Fletcher's direct testimony was damaging to the appellant as it pertained to the question of guilt and special punishment issues, particularly future dangerousness. Skelton sought to neutralize the effect of Fletcher's testimony by establishing an immediate rapport with her before the jury and using her as a friendly witness. Skelton aimed to recast Fletcher's direct testimony in a less daunting light and portrayed Brittle as another Charles Manson whose pernicious influence led both Fletcher and Appellant astray. Fletcher's testimony was susceptible to interpretation as demonstrating a calculated and cold-blooded bent. Skelton induced the following testimony from Fletcher on cross-examination. During her sophomore year of college, Fletcher first heard from Brittle when he answered a letter she had written to another San Quentin inmate 
apparently as part of an unspecified school project. They began to correspond, and Fletcher became infatuated with Brittle, who soon married him. When Brittle was paroled, they moved to Los Angeles, and Fletcher became estranged from her family. Under Brittle's tutelage, Fletcher turned to prostitution and shoplifting to support their habit. Skelton was able to ameliorate the impact of some of the appellant's statements surrounding the offense by having Fletcher give the jury her impressions of what appellant meant. For instance, at the time Banks paid for their meal on Friday night, Brittle and even Fletcher herself also remarked that he seemed to have a lot of money in his wallet, although nobody talked of robbing him at that point. As they fled to Dallas, both Fletcher and Appellant began to fear Brutal, who insisted the three shouldn't separate. Skelton began to develop the theme that Appellant, like Fletcher, had fallen under Brutal's influence. Skelton argued at the punishment stage that, removed from that influence, Appellant wouldn't pose a future danger to society. The Appellant's defense posture was facilitated by Skelton's cross-examination of Fletcher. The court found no conflict of interest and concluded that counsel's performance wasn't adversely affected by his prior representation of Fletcher. The appellant's first point of error is overruled, as the trial court erred in overruling her objection to the jury charge that it failed to authorize the jury to convict of the lesser-included offense of aggravated robbery. The evidence didn't raise the lesser-included offense of aggravated robbery, and the record provides no affirmative basis for a rational jury to reject that account. The appellant's second point of error is overruled, as the evidence didn't raise the lesser-included offense of aggravated robbery. The evidence didn't support a jury's inference that appellant acted either as a principal actor in or as a party to the strangulation of Banks and later of Skeens. Mike gets on one end of the rope and Pam gets on the other and they simply pull on it till he dies. Sometimes it's really hard to deal with watching people out my window working outside other inmates. So. Mike put the rope around Banks' neck. He said, y'all are going to be a part of this too. I've been locked up more of my life than I have free. I never really thought about the consequences of anything. I didn't believe that what happened had just happened. Mental pressure, sitting in a cell 24 hours a day all day long, thinking about, it, are they going to kill you, when, and... Is what got me the death penalty. I was very young. I was scared. The record bears out this finding, as Miranda warnings must proceed a confession offered under Article 38.22 and the right to terminate the interview at any time is not expressly among those warnings required by Miranda. The appellant's fourth point of error is overruled as the trial court erred in sustaining the court's challenge for cause against Veneerman Griggs. Griggs indicated she believed capital punishment was unacceptable but defense counsel was able to elicit an admission from Griggs that she could answer each question individually in the affirmative if proven so beyond a reasonable doubt. The trial court interceded, pressing Griggs for a more definite answer, and the court found that Griggs didn't want to be a party to sentencing someone to demise. In a case involving Veneerman Griggs, the trial court faced a conflicting question about her ability to answer special questions affirmatively. Griggs initially stated that she could answer the questions affirmatively, but later admitted that she would answer at least one of the questions negatively. The court trial then granted the state's challenge for cause, citing her strong opposition to capital punishment. Defense counsel objected to Griggs' different answers and declined to voir dire her further. The appellant argued that Griggs was a vacillating veneerman, indicating that she couldn't be excluded from service in a capital case. The trial court found that Griggs was substantially impaired in her ability to perform her duties as a juror in accordance with her instructions and oath. The trial court ruled that Griggs was not challengeable, and the trial court committed no error in granting the state's challenge for cause against her. The appellant's fourth point of error is overruled, and the fifth point of error is also overruled. The judgment of the trial court is affirmed. Habeas Corpus Relief Granted the Texas Department of Criminal Justice's Institutional Division, Gary Johnson, appeals the district court's final judgment granting Pamela Perillo's 28 U.S.C. 2254 petition for habeas corpus relief. The district court determined that Perillo's trial counsel labored under an actual conflict of interest that adversely affected her presentation of her defense on the issues of both guilt and punishment at her 1980 trial. 
The district court vacated the criminal justice against Perillo, both as to her conviction and demise sentence, and ordered that Perillo be released unless the state of Texas elected to retry her within 120 days of the date upon which the district court's decision became final. The parties argue that the disposition of the second appeal is in some measure determined by our prior consideration of this case. The court didn't venture far afield of our prior decision as the factual context relied upon by the district court, the circumstances surrounding Skelton's cross-examination of Linda Fletcher at Perillo's trial is in fact raised in our prior opinion. Perillo argues that the prior opinion is binding to the extent it constitutes this court's reasoned position on presumed facts that are confirmed by the record on remand. The court takes issue with Perillo's broad suggestion that we're constrained to afford relief on the force of our prior disposition. The crime of Perillo v. State involved the slaying of Robert Banks and Robert Skeens, which took place over 19 years ago. Perillo met Brittle and his wife Fletcher in 1980 and robbed a gentleman. The trio fled California to avoid arrest for the robbery, and Perillo joined the couple en route in Tucson, Arizona, and eventually ended up in Houston, Texas. The crime involved Pam Perillo, Mike Brittle, and Linda Fletcher, who were involved in the slaying. Perillo's confession made her the state's strongest capital case, and she was called to trial first. Perillo was represented by attorneys Robert Scott and William Birch. Fletcher's trial was prepared with her attorney Jim Skelton, who declined the plea offer on Fletcher's behalf. The state re-indicted Fletcher on two counts of aggravated robbery and dismissed the capital slay indictment. Fletcher proceeded to trial on the two aggravated robbery counts in October 1980. I came two days from my execution. I was walking into the visiting room to the Fifth Circuit has just given you a... They claim I had a conflict of interest because I had represented Linda in an earlier trial. And At Fletcher's trial, Skelton aimed to demonstrate Fletcher's innocence by placing blame on Perillo and Brittle. Skelton argued that Fletcher's background was good and that a relationship with Brittle began as a result of a misguided sociological experiment. Fletcher was convicted on both counts of aggravated robbery but was sentenced to only five years probation. After her trial, Fletcher and her attorney Skelton stayed in contact through written correspondence and telephone calls. In May of 1981, Brittle was extradited to Texas and Skelton encouraged the Banks and Skeens families to contact Fletcher about the crimes to obtain closure and explore their theory that there were more than three people involved in the slaying. In 1982, Skelton was instrumental in securing Fletcher's testimony for the state. The exact type of immunity that Skelton negotiated for Fletcher's testimony against Brittle remains unclear. The trial record reflects that the state entered into a prosecutional agreement that Fletcher would receive immunity from further prosecution in exchange for her testimony against Brittle. However, the evidence doesn't definitively reflect that Fletcher unambiguously enjoyed complete and binding transactional immunity as opposed to merely a prosecutional agreement not to prosecute. The district court's judgment granting Perillo's 28 U.S.C. 2254 petition for relief from her capital conviction and sentence is affirmed and the cause is remanded for further proceedings consistent with this opinion. The court found that Skelton went to California primarily for the purpose of representing Perillo's interests and only coincidentally to represent Fletcher's interests. The court also held that Perillo's and Fletcher's interests with respect to Skelton's concurrent representation in California were identical because both women wanted to avoid the subpoena for Fletcher's testimony at Perillo's trial. However, the court couldn't affirm the district court's factual determinations on these issues as Perillo knew Skelton was going to California, but she didn't know the true character of Skelton's prior representation of Fletcher and didn't understand the potential for conflict should Fletcher be ordered to return. The record demonstrates that the possibility of avoiding the subpoena was small and the risk of an ensuing conflict should Fletcher be ordered to return was large. The court rejects the district court's determination that Fletcher and Perilla's interests with respect to the California proceedings were identical. The court also found that Fletcher gave substantially the same testimony that she had given at the trial of Brittle 
but the court found some significance in the fact that Fletcher's testimony at Perillo's trial included damaging new details that came in unchallenged by Skelton. The court also excluded consideration of the print evidence, which would have been Fletcher's pre-trial statement or her testimony at Brittle's trial, which Skelton claims he never read or reviewed until the night before Fletcher testified. The court continues to believe that Skelton's personal relationship with Fletcher confirms the reality of Skelton's conflicted position. The court's en banc opinion in Beat limited the application of Kyler to the multiple representation context, holding that Kyler replies only when there's an conflict between the adverse interests of two or more clients. The decision that there was an actual conflict in these cases doesn't depend upon Skelton's personal relationship with Fletcher, as there is ample evidence to establish that conflict without reliance upon the more subjective aspects of Skelton's relationship with Fletcher and her family. The application of a lowered standard of prejudice in Kyler cases is supported by two reasons. First, a cold record may not reveal the erosion of zeal that may ensue from divided loyalty. Second, the Supreme Court recognizes institutional reasons supporting a rigid rule of presumed prejudice for conflicts of interest. Defense counsel owes the client a duty of loyalty, including the duty to avoid conflicts of interest. Trial courts can play an important role in situations inherently rife with conflict by asserting whether the defendant understands the consequences of the potential conflict and still wants to continue with the present lawyer. This rationale is also at play in the Kyler case, where the trial court, prosecutors, and Skelton all showed solitude for Fletcher's knowledge and understanding of the implications of the actual conflict burdening Skelton's performance without making any inquiry intended to protect Perilla's interests. Convicted of capital slay in 1980, Pamela sat on Texas's ending row, awaiting lethal injection, but less than two days before her scheduled ending, she was given a second chance and in 2000, she was resentenced from demise to life in prison with the possibility of parole. Her first chance at a new life had come shortly after her arrest when Pamela embraced the Christian faith and began bringing her fellow inmates to redemption in Christ. That's all for this video. Thanks a lot for watching and we'll see you again next time.